Uh, I made two videos before about the new discovery of Bell's theorem that the universe functions non locally. This is proof that Einstein was wrong. I made a second video that if these implications are correct because John Bell made an uh, assumption that we had to abandon something that we already accept you know, fundamentally in physics, we either had to accept loca uh, reject locality, reject realism, or reject both. And I did a video that what would happen if we reject both. Uh, it leads to idealism, or at least a, ver or a version of idealism that we usually call it as such. Now, there's been a new experimentation as well about the Winger's friend thought experiment. It's been uh, test in a laboratory for the first time because for the longest time we didn't have the technological means to actually somehow do it. But there is another problem. If the Winger's experiment can be proven on a laboratory, it can be proven experimentally, there is a, an also problem that goes against the assumption and also my assumption because I'm a reductive physicalist and most scientists and philosophers are also reductive physicalists. But there's the interesting part. If Winger's friend experiment can be proven in a laboratory, as some studies suggest, it makes a case for du dualism of all things somehow. Because Winger's friend made an assumption of an interactionist substance dualism, the same approach that Rene Descartes has used. For people who are skeptics, uh, myself, I am skeptical of everything that is considered paranormal, supernatural, etc. We often associate colloquially that substance dualism is associated with religion, full stop, even though not all religions subscribe to substance dualism, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, if scientifically speaking we could prove the existence of Winker's friend thought experiment in the laboratory, making a solid case for dualism, especially substance dualism, and that's an interesting thing we had to worry about. And I remember in the previous video I did mention that there is a quantum experiment we could use to actually make a case for it, or at least if the, to see if there's a validity of substance dualism in science, especially quantum mechanics by Lossy in a book, Quantum Mechanics and Consciousness, which is the first like academic book, you know, talking about the subject of consciousness and quantum mechanics, which for the longest time was considered a French idea, you know, at the, since post-World War II, you know, physics. But also, it's another interesting development that is going on recently about these things, we had to reconsider the possibilities. And if quant and because we show that Bell's theorem is true, and if if the all local interpretation of quantum mechanics that rely on local realism or some same perform are out of the window, like the many worlds interpretation. So the only thing we have left are the non-local interpretations of quantum mechanics, right? Which only like a few handful around. But if the Winker's friend thought experiment is true as they say, if the experiment suggests, like I mentioned in the previous video, and the studies have shown that not only reality as we currently know it does not exist, there is no objectivity, this also goes against the scientific method altogether, which is the which is a fundamental core of our epistemology because it's based on methodological naturalism. You can still you know, you can still argue that Things that we often consider supernatural or paranormal can still be true under methodological naturalism. So that may be a naturalist explanation of things that we often associate as not natural, right? But in the Winger's friend thought experiment show there's only like a few hand picked interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics that we had to reconsider. Like back then, before the Lou Bell's discovery, there's only been like 10 or 11 or something interpretation. Now, plus with the Winger's Fred experiment proving in a laboratory, now we only have like three, maybe four interpretations of quantum mechanics on the table. We had the relational interpretation by Carlo Rivelli. We also had the von Neumann interpretation, o o most commonly known as the consciousness cause collapse interpretation. And we also have uh, the consistent interpretation of quantum mechanics. But people who still use non-local interpretation but rely on heterobios like Boone theory, then this is no longer the case. For example, if the, in order to maintain realism, right, on like you know metaphysical realism, there's things exist out there outside our mind, so to speak. If the, it's called the boom mechanic or boomian mechanics. 
Uh, but the problem is, as many philosophers have pointed out with the recent COVID, uh, I will point to the, although I do not agree with him on many philosophical issues, but like he he is a objective idealist, also known as a monist idealist, este Bernardo Castro's has wrote about the issue, este, some non-local hidden variable theory that preserve non-intuitive forms of realism, such as perhaps booms, may still be reconciled with contextuality. However, these three we postulate often on the cause of mathematical acrobatics, extra theoretical entities that are both empirically outgrounded and unnecessary for predictive purposes. Uh, by granting that, given the experimental result, it has been cited uh, for Buhonian mechanics is the survival hope for realism. And many uh, experts, as uh, implicitly at least, acknowledge that other more popular terms indeed are viable. And because there are many reasons why Buhonian mechanics traditionally been rejected by physicists, although for different sort of reasons, right? But a physicist named Lobus Maud has also made a case against Buhonian mechanics. Yet, uh, he says right here, according to the physicist, lots of people whose goals are confined in a spherical bubble are imagining that they're creative geniuses who are thinking outside the box, but the reality is inside out. One need to perform the spherical inversion to see it. There's narrow mind and intellectually limited, uh, confined to a bubble with a proper solution requiring the realms outside of the bubble. <laughs> And Bernardo continues, although I presume that these lively words were meant for me, I confess they to uh, appreciate Gale. You see, a common prejudice people have about physicists is that they are boring. Well, I can't blame them, especially on the math side of things. Uh, Mole clearly is anything but, right? And lo and behold, we este, proceed to make an agreement not only with Bernardo's view, but the very essay he was supposed to object to. He pointed out that theoretical extension of quantum theory meant to salvage some form of realism are artificial and pointless. That quantum theory as we know is the best theory we had to describe reality and that no extension are needed. Uh, these are precisely the point that Bernardo was making, even his reference to relational interpretation of quantum mechanics by Carlo Rovelli doesn't contradict most argument. For Rovelli doesn't extend quantum mechanics in any way. He simply acknowledged the implications of quantum mechanics. And the, again, these are the problems with quantum mechanics. We end up with the same prediction as proper quantum mechanics. It's a complete lie. The dark always has a clear position which is guided by the tidal wave, way. As said, there's easy to see that a particle can have well-defined other numbers, like a spin, because it will pick objectively prefer C axis in space and that will break the rotational symmetry. Also in quantum field theory, the number of particles is variable. They may be created, uh, pair created, pair annihilated. So it's clearly impossible there is a specific classical position on N particles. The number N is a even well-defined, moreover. Two particles could never exactly hit each other and annihilate. It the probability of the classical physics for the exact hit is zero, which is still true even to some extra pilot way affecting the classical particle motion. Bohian also failed to explain what happens when the objectively real pilot waves, when the particle is measured or observed, and how the initial state of the pilot wave is prepared. Their theory always inevitably contradicts the Lorentz invariance, prohibit one form choosing situation dependent i.e. the Hamitoria dependent base that are relevant for different observations and different systems. It just doesn't work at all. The Bohemian mechanic is just a slight hand meant to convince sloppy people that one doesn't need the, to abandon the pillars of classical physics, even though they have been clearly falsified. Shack correctly points out that Bohemian mechanics is almost certainly wrong because its basic classical object, the guiding way, is in principle unobservable because a change of it should in principle impact things at a distance, but it never does. So one really needs to at least fine tune infinitely many things to make these a priori observable aspects of the pilot way observable. To match the reality, we avoid the contradiction with relativity. Even an infinite amount of fine tuning isn't really enough to achieve this goal. Este, in Bujurio Mechanic, it's not the case that elementary particles entity is both a particle and a wave. What is the case is that there is a particle and there, and there is a wave. 
concurrently but separately, while moving the particle simply rise the wave. If it is, and then the electric creates the illusion of wave particle duality in the double slit experiment. Clearly, this is attempt to preserve, as Moy pointed out, a classical view of reality all the way down to the quantum level. But when one makes the detailed implication of the theory ex explicit, all kinds of contradiction will pop out. Okay, as the Another interpretation of quantum mechanics that's been popular, uh, one of the best defenders right now is Roger Spencer, called the Objective Collapse Theory, right? But the problem with the Objective Collapse Theory is it go, uh, it's been refuted because experiments have now show quantum effects persist even for microscopic objects. While in this Collapse Theory, it, according to that theory, interpretation of quantum mechanics, that should not be the case, but it's been shown to be the case. And this is good news because the objective collapse interpretation of quantum mechanics, especially at the Roger Spencer's approach, uh, his interpretation of quantum mechanics believe that true artificial intelligence is impossible, Boltzmann brains are impossible, as the mind uploading is impossible, and other things that are possible under computationalist, functionalist approach of philosophy of mind are possible under those circumstances while the objective coalesce interpretation view that this is not possible. But like I said, it, it, the quantum effect persists even microscopic object completely refuted the objective coalesce theory. Because the collapse theory predicts when a particle of matter becomes more massive than some threshold, they cannot remain in a quantum superposition or going through both slits at once, and this will destroy the interest factor. Arn's team has set to a molecule with more than 800 atoms through the double slit, and they, are still, and they still see interface, and search of the threshold continues. This rules out the objective collapse theory for, for objects, masses, molecules with more than 800 atoms, each compromising thousands, even hundreds of fundamental subatomic particles, such as quarks and electrons, but we have to keep on searching. Right? At the and because of interesting implications of these phenomena, if dualism is true, right, if the, there's been a book that's been published, an academic and peer reviewed book, right, for the first time in history, but well, not maybe in the first time ever, but like, you know, first time in a long, long time, that makes a case for the possibility that consciousness survives physical bodily death. It's called Consciousness Unbound. It's, it's a peer-reviewed academic book, and I wanted to make sure if the book is actually legitimate or not, so I went to each chapter, because there's like 30 people involved in this project, and I Google search each member on Rational Wiki to see if there's a pseudoscience or new age nonsense page dedicated to these people, and out of the 30 people, give or take, only one has a page, so I'm like, okay, so there is some legitimacy to this book, and surprisingly, the same publication who published the book Consciousness Unbound, who trying to make a peer review academic case for consciousness survive, but it left. It's the same publication that published the opposite, uh, the myth of the afterlife, the case against life after death, edited by Ka Keith Augustine and Michael Martin, which I can, if you want to see why they make a case against it, it's a great article. They talk about, you know, people who try to experience near death experience are just illusions or delusions or false memories, argument from brain damage, argument from physical and chemical processes, and there is no legitimate legitimate justification for it, or at least there's no reason to believe without any at least more evidence to reconsider. Uh, the only problem I have with the book of Myth of the Afterlife is, even though, again, it's a, it's a peer-reviewed academic book of 30 or 40 people, out of the 30, 40 people, only two of them are neuroscientists or cognitive psychologists or, you know, feel related to study, you know, the consciousness and stuff like that. The rest are just, you know, philosophers or, or a medical doctor or stuff like that. So it's like, I'm like, you couldn't find more people trying to defend your case. And the same thing, I have a problem with consciousness unbound, which has the same problem. They only had two or three of them are neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, while the others are like philosophers and physicists or medical doctors etc so i'm like it has the same problem i don't know maybe maybe it's a rule that you need two people of pacific field to make a case i don't know 
Uh, the second problem I have with the myth of the afterlife is they hold an outdated view of philosophy of mind, which is type identity theory, which since the 1960s, no philosopher or scientist subscribe to my mind identity theory anymore. Most philosopher scientists subscribe to computationalist functionalism, which there's a reason cognitive psychology as a disability exists to begin with because of the computation and functionalist thesis became the dominant position. So they are relying on an outdated approach to mind, especially a naturalistic approach, even though there are other naturalistic approaches that are more more likely to be true than type of gender theory. You know, it uh, well interesting about consciousness of balance, well even if we're trying to make a case for Con- survive uh, survival consciousness beyond bodily death. It doesn't specific uh, prefer one theory over the other approach, right? It has a diversity of views, um, and the uh, and the end of the book, the final chapter, basically analyze each philosophical position. Actually, criticize the ones that looks like doesn't hold up well. If they, for example, if they, if you believe in reincarnation, both the myth of the afterlife and consciousness unbound. You know, one making a case against, one making a case for after, like, both have criticized reincarnation. Like, even the book, Conscious of the there's a chapter trying to make a case for reincarnation. The author himself has submitted, yeah, it's flawed and questionable. And the last chapter points out the same thing. It's like, yeah, the, the, the reincarnation approach is probably not likely, you know. So, and out of the four philosophical positions, it's the... My mistake. There are eight philosophical positions that make it the possibility for survival of consciousness. Four of them is a personal survival where your consciousness and personal identity survive. While and there's the impersonal survival where your consciousness survive but your personal identity does not. Which for many people doesn't sound. It sounds like the same as nothingness after death, right? It, it sounds the same for many people. It, the the ones that are impersonal are the do aspect monism which that has been basically rejected by now by most experts because like I said Winker's friend you know Bell's free room may lead to a more dualist approach and Carlo Rivelli's relational interpretation of quantum mechanics while many idealists are, are defending his interpretation many idealists are monist idealists also not object idealists but as a, an academic paper by Mauro Dorado has pointed out and I will really pervade them, is defended some foreseeable objections. So to clarify and distinguish philosophical implication in particular, it's considered the relational quantum mechanic presupposes a duality of evolution and ontology, the relational or the rationality of quantum world and intrinsically of the quant- a classical world. It then concentrates on a pluralistic anti-monistic metaphysical consequence of the theory due to the impossibility of assigning quantum state to the entire universe. Finally, interesting consequences of relational quantum mechanics with respect to the possibility of defining a local quantum revolution that becomes are nodded. Given the difficulty with the cosmic form becoming recognized by priority monism, relational interpretation seems to present important advantages with respect to monistic views, at least as far as the possibility of explaining our experience of time you know and those but if relational interpretation is correct, then it goes against any monist view of, of philosophy, or at least the majority of them. And the theories that make a case for a personal survival are some versions of object idealism. And at the Bernard de Cospo, who is one of the well known philosophers making a case of idealism nowadays, he is very inconsistent on his view. Sometimes he says it's a personal survival is possible. Sometimes he says it is not possible. It's only impersonal survival. And sometimes he says it, he subscribed to impersonal survival, but but he's open to personal survival. So it's like I don't know what the hell his position is. He changed the uh, position multiple times, so I have no idea. Uh, the, there's also, of course, the dualist. You know, that's basically take for granted, with the exception of property dualism. But like that's a different story. Uh, the, there's also subject idealism 
este, which are many versions. People confuse it with solipsism, which is a completely different position. And there's also pluralistic philosophies, especially pluralistic idealism, with the, or pluralistic naturalism even sometimes, like Hillary Poopman, is open open the possibility of a personal survival at the, his pluralistic approach to naturalism and pragmatism and Lipson's a philosoph the, one of the best known philosophers of the scientific revolution was a pluralistic uh, ideal with his monads and many philosophers point out I will point out a philosopher called William Hexer although to be honest I want to reject everything he says outright because he's a Christian philosopher so I'm like uh but like I said, uh, like I'm looking exclusively academic peer review papers or journals and stuff like that. So I'm not going to go to a religious website trying to make it for or against something, right? <laughs> because obviously it's not a peer review academic. This is more like a polemic piece in many cases. And before I go on, I forgot to mention one thing. Este, in the last chapter, Consciousness Unbound, when he makes a final survey and moves to a philosophical positions, right, has criticized, like both idealists and natural, has criticized neutral monism and panpsychism. It uh, has problematic on multiple fields. And uh, even David Jowell, who is sympathetic to the least radical version of panpsychism, which is pan protopsychism, uh, has admitted that the combination probably has. And it's like its own problem has to deal with before trying to actually make a case for panpsychism of any kind. And neutral monism, as also in the book, has criticized neutral monism because it's also incoherent in many cases and failed to define what do you mean by neutrality and also what do you mean by physical. It's like it's been it's been so ill defined that it could be anything you wish for. So that's an interesting analysis that I failed to see when it comes to neutral monism. And also, David Chalmers' book, Reality Plus and the Promise of Philosophy, he's actually, even though he's a property dualist, he doesn't believe in something to do with it, but he has said that if we live or we decide to live in a simulation, there are two types of simulations. There's the pure simulation and there's the impure simulation. But interesting, in an impure simulation, is proof substance dualism, Cartesian style. So I'm like, oh, that's an interesting analysis coming from a person who is critical of it, they prefer property dualism instead, so this is an interesting analysis. And going back to has uh, to the philosopher trying to say, yeah, you know, make it against type identity theory. For me, you don't need to make a case against type identity theory because no philosopher scientist now that subscribe to it. Everybody's a computationally functionalist. You don't necessarily need the brain for consciousness, right? But has he point out that when you try to make a type identity approach, especially when it comes against, against afterlife discourse, right? They often cite the book The Emergent Self, right? If the, but they fail to point out that in that same book, even though trying to make against, you know, Cartesian uh, dualism and the afterlife, but in the same source they point a lot, you know, The Emergent Self has failed to point out this statement. If the, in exploring this statement, however, by ignore the final qualified phase, the Cartesian dualist, and I'm quoting from the person by the way, I believe they have problem with this regard, but this may not be true for some version of dualism. Arguably, it's not true for Thomistic dualism, which the soul is the form of the body. A typical Thomistic claim that rational thought has no body organ must, however, be given up. And it is not true for emergent dualism, which is a substantial soul emerged from the functioning of the brain and nervous system. There may, uh, may be other objective to these and other variations on non cartesian dualism, but they are not as vulnerable to the neurological evidence as uh, the people trying to make against. They devote some attention to possible falsification of the dependence thesis, chiefly by experimenting what we allege out of body experience, near death experience, etc., which information is supposedly obtained in ways that define normal scientific explanation. They argue that such possible results have been obtained or flawed because the experiments are inadequate control or because they cannot be replicated or for other comparable reasons. It is certain that standards being applied here are entirely appropriate if it were examined the claim that paranormal evidence provide conclusive scientific proof for the non-physical mind. The approach taken by Augustine and Fishman might be the right one, but they are aiming higher than this. They are not satisfied with verdict of not proven. 
Their aim is to discredit entirely of the thesis. Given this objective, it is questionable whether they can afford to dismiss as irrelevant studies that fall short of perfection, not to speak of anecdotal ed- evidence, which they do not even consider. Those who believe it, you know, if they may consider it. And some st- philosophers I am, has claimed that anecdotal evidence has some justification, right? In medical research, less than perfect studies are not typically rejected outright, rather, they are carefully. Av- evaluated for their possible significance, and physicians treating individual patients typically operate with much less than ideal information without thereby being any less rational. Uh, and when uh, Renato Bradley argues for emergent materialism, after rehearsing some anti dualist arguments, he states, those who adopt the metaphysical hypothesis of substitutism get their thinking tied up knots when we ask the simple and most obvious question how the ideas are to cash out. And the, now the popularity of the filter brain hypothesis, you know, to study the brain, if there's coming some popularity, but that theory has pos- a uh, has its roots in making a case for dualism, and so for we know why. Right? Uh, there's also the polarization object to a new body afterlife, stuff like that. That, that is the problem that it would be possible for a person to be multiply res- uh, resurrected. This is argument against Christianity. And the letter is no problem for material theory of the resurrection. But Drago, Paul Drago argued that even if there were no physical soul, that would help. If false by definition, non physical, they, they cannot be identified or individ- individuated principles. Uh, David Wilson argued that non physical souls will violate the physical laws. And in, uh, Leon Engor says that physical formulas are not violated, no soul controls the body. And David Papineo concludes there is no trace of soul link to the body. A bit more later on these. Uh, Drago Kim, one of my favorite philosophers of the mind, has him how f- familiar question how could a pair of non physical soul to, uh, to a physical body? This is an anti condition argument, you know, if the us apply only if non physical soul are also soon to be non spatial. If the Susan Blackmore argued the impossible impossibility of astral bodies and astral worlds, and you know, other similar arguments. If the but uh, the, the dependency thesis of the mind brain, like I said, no philosopher now that everybody's a computation functionalist, and even integrate information for you, as a minute that consciousness does, does not necessarily need a brain for consciousness. And a physicist named Andrew Knight has made a case like against this, like if the brain doesn't need to produce consciousness, uh, like a, for example, like some philosophers have pointed out for a non-local approach to non-consciousness, now with Bell's Freeman, this may have more possibility. These leave for unexpected, you know, underdeveloped the theory of afterlife, you know, in a non-local approach, which is, you know, if the brain does not produce consciousness, then everything is, is on the table, all bets are off, you know, if the... You know, when people talk about, well, if you look at neurons and synapses, it shows you the unique brain and stuff like that. But that's the same argument. For example, if you look at Fadeo, a book, uh, you know, by Plato, has made a similar argument. When someone trying to make fun of Plato, where it's like, this wonderful hole we dash is I went reading and saw the man made no use of mind, nor gave it any responsibility for the management of things. But mentions causing air, ether, and water, and many other strange things. That seems to to me, much like saying that Socrates' actions are all due to his mind and then trying to tell the cause of everything I do. To say the reason that I am sitting here because my body consists of bones and sinews, because the bones are hard and are separated by joints, and the sinews are such as to contract equilibrium, and they surround the bones along my flesh and skin, which hold them together. Then, as the bones are hanging in their sockets, the relaxation and contraction of the sunno enable me to bend my lips. And that because of me sitting here, my limbs are bent. So, you know, nothing has changed for the most part. In fact, recent meta-analysis study of often we consider paranormal phenomenon, right? Like in, in parapsychology, even though I am critical of parapsychology, you know, has given rise to a positive correlation of certain phenomena in meta-analysis. That even the current president of the American Statistical Association, Jessica Utz, in 2016 said it outright. 
and I quote from the person, right? If the, the data in support of precognition and possible other related phenomena are quite strong statistically and will be wisely accepted if they pertain no, to something more mundane. Yet most scientists reject the possibility, uh, possible reality of disability without even looking at the data. I have asked the debunkers if there is any amount of data that would co convince them and the jury had responded by saying probably not. I asked them what ori original research they have read and they mostly admit they haven't read any. Now there is a definition of pseudoscience based in conclusion on belief rather than the data. Again, it may be a controversial claim. Yeah, I'm not trying to defend them. I'm trying to say, like, we had to reconsider John Dewey by no experimentation of Bell's Freeman and Winker's friend that because Winker's friend if they assume a dualist approach, or at least something that goes against our current assumption on defective physical laser, we had to reconsider, right? It may be true, but still consistent with naturalism, right? But regardless. And like another article like at the a newer scientist called at the Abner Alexander who had a near death experiment and says shows the possibility of a personal at the survival of bodily death where your consciousness and personal identity survive in some shape or form. If you are too modest if the do ask by monist is an impersonal one, but if these if we take these experiments for granted, then yes, there are assets don't do it. Me had to question it, but let's say for the sake of it that there's some level of consistency of all these near death experiences, right? That somehow you still have some form of individuality, even though if you believe in an impersonal afterlife. And some cases the the spatial temporal realm is a little different. Like if there's some common ground in all of them, despite the obvious cultural religious differences if there is a common ground something that may have some valid validity even for Hindus and Buddhists who believe in an impersonal reincarnation when they have a near death experience they still have some individuality which goes against their thesis which makes sense because Hinduism in its early years did not have a reincarnation concept they believe in a regular afterlife because of their in the your proto-indo-european past right and they even have a concept of heaven the idea of uh, reincarnation and moksha was added much later after the vedic period not before or during so fun fact is the and a study show like by Sam Harris and at the, who, who even though was critical and other people trying to analyze it's been coming to the conclusion to some extent that the similarity between a lander's near death experience and a DMT Joe Rogan drug rip doesn't defeat the authenticity of the former as a valid transcendent, at the transcendental experience. And again, when trying to criticize the near death experience like myself, it's like maybe it's some activity in the brain or chemical process, but it's pointed out even by Sam Harris that almost no one thinks the consciousness is purely a matter of cognitive activity. At the, to suggest, you know, so this is like a proper like what the what the hell we are actually talking about like witnessing here like another example has been acknowledged by, by sam harris the the even those in you know, the near death experience are true is complicated because like well maybe it's just firing process in the brain or something like while well, he's dying it was like okay but there's a contradiction because even though it has little activity the experience of the person is having the first person is at peak higher than the brain should be doing, even though it's in a capacity where it should not have the experience in question. And like I said, there's been a strange resurgence of substitute dualism and idealism in general in academia, publishing academic peer-reviewed books in 2018, 2019, 2020, 20, like for the first time in 200 years. And like one of the recent examples I will show you is a peer-reviewed academic paper uh, by the Rolly Handbook is the Consustent Dualism and Idealism slash Physicalism Debate by J.B. Moreland. Again, the, I want to discredit everything he says out of association because he's a Christian apologist, but because this is an academic peer review paper, he's not making a case for it. He's being a philosopher for once. <laughs> so, verbatim, out of the chapter to Soy, uh, according to him, like in this introduction paper, I am mean, neither idealist nor the son of one. I am a certain type of substitute dualism, but my overall ontology is closer to idealism than to physicalism. I intend to my defend the substitute dualist to give my idealist friend uh, a bit of encouragement, and my approach is not without precedence. The late John Foster, who was a steady 
idealist philosopher of his writing career, but in the middle of that career, he wrote a rigorous defense of conditioned dualism. He thought, and I think, that breaking the string fold of contemporary este, understanding was a worthy project that created a way este, for other alternatives. In the spirit of John Fester, I will implement two arguments for the generic substance dualism. Uh, by generic, I mean the view according to which, one, there is substantial self solo ego that is, that is uh, non physical, at least our understand, current understanding of the physical. Two, the substantial self soul ego that bear ground to a strict Lebesian, the Cronian personal identity. And three, the self it is not identical to the body or any of its physical parts. Este, in this view, este, the quote unquote soul is a substance that essentially explains the property, power, actual property, disposition, property of consciousness. It, uh, some will add that the uh, anime diffuse and make and makes alive the body, but this addition is not important for what follows. There are arguments for something to this, but I shall limit my presentation to two of them: the model argument and the meteorological argument. The model argument: the core of the argument is pretty simple. I am possibly a uh, disability, at least how the terminology has been accepted. It, uh, my brain or body is not possibly disembodied that cannot, uh, cannot survive without physical being physical, so I am not my brain or body. Thus, there is something true of, of me, I may have the model probably of being possibly disembodied. That is not true of my brain or body, I cannot be my brain or body, I am neither a soul or brain or body. I am a soul in the argument, it possibly means the metaphysical possibility of you prefer the logical possibility. Uh, thought experiment had rigorously been central to debates about the personal identity. For example, we often invite the consideration of situation which some beasts exist, David Chalmers' famous popular life. True persons switch uh, bodies, brains, or personality traits that persist. This is a body. In these thought experiments, someone argued in the following way. Because of a certain state of affairs, it's conceivable this probable justification for thinking that S is metaphysical possible. Now, if S is possible, then certain implications follow about what is slash is not essential. And that we, will, we all use com Convincing as a test of possibility slash impossibility throughout our lives. I know that life on other planets is possible, even though it's highly unlikely or, or downright false, because I can conceive it to be so. I'm aware of what it is to be alive and to be on Earth, and conceive no necessary connection between these two properties. I know I know square circles are impossible because it is inconceivable, given my knowledge of being square and being circle. Este, to be sure, judgment that a state of affairs possible and impossible grounded in possibility are not infallible. They can be wrong. Still, they provide strong evidence for genuine possibility slash impossibility. In light of this, I offer the following criteria, what we call the model principle of credulity. For the entity X and Y, if I have a good grounds for believing that I conceive of X existing without, i.e. a dog without being color brown or vice versa that a good ground for believing that x being brown is not essential or identical to y being a dog and vice versa. Let us apply this insight by conceivability and possibility of the moral argument for substance dualism. And it goes as follows. 1. The law of identity. Necessarily, if x is identical to y, then whatever is true is possible true of x is true or possibly true of y and vice versa. 2. I can strongly conceive of myself as a sitting decent body. For example, I have no difficulty believing the near death experience are possible. That is, that is, they could be true. At the 3. If I strongly conceive of some state of affairs, at the of S, I at the, the understanding of something doing it, then S possibly obtained. They have good ground for believing that S, that is, S is possible. 4. Therefore, I have good ground for believing in myself that it is possible for me to assist in. Well, against uh, the physical body, if, uh, the, even though what is this the theory can be different from theory to theory. If something x, for example, i, that such is possible for x to exist without y, for example, my brain or body, then i, x, for example, myself, is not identical to y, my brain or body, and true, and, and y, my brain or body, is not essential to x, myself. My body or brain is not such as possible to exist. Uh, this body or my body or brain is essentially physical. Therefore, I have good ground for believing in myself that I am not identical to my body or brain and that my physical body is not essential to me. 
A parallel argument can be advanced which the notion of a body and disembodied are replaced with notions of physical objects. So understood, the argument will apply the conclusion that I have good ground for thinking that I am not identical to the physical object, nor is any physical object essential to me. A parallel argument can also be developed to show that possessing the ultimate capacity of sensation, thought, belief, design, and volition are essential to me as I am substantial, mine. I could not exist without the ultimate capacity of consciousness. I cannot undertake a fourth defense of the argument here, but it would be useful to say a bit more regarding number two. The argument's crucial premise there are a number of things about ourselves and our brain which that we are aware of the ground conceivability expressed in two. I'm aware that I'm on extended that I'm fully present at each location of my body as I'll Augustine claim. I occupy my body as at the as occupied space by being fully presented throughout. I may not complex aggregate made by substantial parts, nor I am a sort of thing that can be composed of physical parts, but rather I am a basic unity of inseparable faculties of mind, volition, emotion, etc. The sustained absolute sameness through uh, through change. I am not capable of gradation. I cannot I cannot become two thirds of a person. In a near-death experience, people report themselves to have been disembodied. They are not aware of having bodies in any sense, rather they are aware of themselves as a unified ego, they have sensations, thoughts, and so forth. They have no difficulty of conceiving, not conceiving is not the same thing as imagining, of a, a near-death experience as existing in a disembodied state. Does this provide ground for thinking that time is a real possibility, even if a disembodied state never actually happened, though of course, it, it, I believe it does. It, this is not me, by the way. This is the, uh, the peer review paper. And thus, we cannot be one's base and brain, nor one's body slash brain essential to form instead of one is a soul. Uh, there is a physical response to this argument that goes like this. The notion of possibility used in an argument is not metaphysically or logically possibility. Whether it's an epistemic possibility. A epistemic possibility means for all we know such and such may be metaphysically slash logically possible and such and such may not be metaphysically slash logically possible. To illustrate suppose to unknown to me that a table in my kitchen is actually made of particles, boards, though I believe it is made of wood. My son-in-law Carlos asked me is it possible to take the table is made of particles. Who am I to say? And so far, so far, we could go. I will skip that because it's a very elaborate and long detail. This last statement shows that something can be epistemically possible for I know the table is made of a particle board and people exist in the body without being really slash metaphysically possible. Even if the table is made of wood, you can't just, you can't be the same table if we were made of particle boards. If people are physical objects, then their disability is metaphysically impossible. Does this objection, the model argument, use epistemic possibility, not metaphysical possibility, and no real possibility follow from mere epistemic possibilities work? Not really. And to see why, consider the following account of a, a, a near death experience by, a, 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 by Kimberly Karshaw, who, having a near death experience a, a, in, a, a, in a very young age, she went to the hospital, right? The interesting part, she never went to this hospital before. This is the very first time, but she was having a near death experience. She would not have the brain capacity to be aware of what, what was going on around her. So even though she wa was aware of what was going on around her, and she was in a hospital that she never even been before, she experienced seeing things in location where she should not know, which is like an employee's only room. If it, and somehow she was correct about certain details despite one is an employee's only place and two she never even been in the hospital in question before of her life. Maria was interviewed by other witnesses to the day who corroborate the incidents. It is important to note that this account is just one in, in, of millions and millions of near death experiences that occur. We have numerous accounts on them. The account you just read is quite typical. For our purpose, note that the account does not contain any combination of states of affairs. They are not metaphysically possible or logically consistent. I uh, that there are hundreds of accounts, and not one of them contain logically inconsistent or metaphysically incompatible state of affairs. Even if all near-death experience accounts are false, it's a crystal clear when. If the, you read them, they are surely metaphysically possible. The only argument against their metaphysical possibility would be disqualifying question begging assumptions before to consider the evidence. The truth is that almost everyone, including well educated atheists like myself, is to recognize that any of these are metaphysically possible. 
I do detain the possibility, but under naturalism, like to suggest the continuity of consciousness, temporal immortality, and Bosman brain, you know, stuff like that. So maybe. How do I know this? Because virtually everyone is willing to hear the evidence for NDEs and decide on the basis of whether or not they are real. On April 12 to 13, 2022, uh, 2012, Gary Hepperson, Peter Kresslands, and J.P. Moreland uh, did a two-day debate in a life after death with opponents like Marco Shermer, Steven Stranger, and Keith Parson. Here's the intention thing to note. Everyone in the debate was willing to allow the evidence to settle whether or not the entities were real. Uh, Shermer, Stranger, and Parson dispute the evidence and argue that it's inadequate. The very fact that the evidence on the lack thereof settled the issue shows that they assumed the entities were metaphysically possible. Uh, no one would let the evidence settle the claim that a group of people had discovered Field Square Circle in Montana. When NBC's deadline does show on entities millions of people watching, including millions of very skeptical people. Why? Because they want to know the evidence. But those same people will never watch a deadline program on the discovery of a square circle in Montana. Square circles are metaphysically impossible and we don't need to look for evidence to know they are real. But it's a difference with NDEs. We watch and we debate the evidence because we know that NED just might be real because they are at least metaphysically possible. In this way, NDEs account provide strong evidence for premise 2 on the modal argument. There's also the meteorological argument. Besides the model, the meteorological provides strong evidence for something to listen. Let us grant that the scientific image of reality is correct. In this view, the standard meteorological hierarchy is the ontology that currently captures the structure of reality. The category of individual, everything above the level of atomic symbols and microphysical level, assuming they are atomic symbols, are meteorological ingredient composed of separate parts. This includes the body and various organs, including the brain. Now consider the following argument. One. If something is a physical object composed of parts, it does not survive over time at the same object if it goes to the same different part. 2. My body and brain are physical objects composed of part. 3. Therefore, my body and brain do not survive over time at the same object they come to have different parts. 4. My body and brain are constantly coming to different parts. 5. Therefore, my body and brain if they do not survive over time at the same object. 6. I do survive over the time at the same object. And seven, therefore I am not my body or my brain. Eight, I am either at the a brain at the or a mind. And therefore I am a mind or in his case so at the yeah. And it's true in neuroscience, you don't need the full brain to have consciousness. Study has shown you only need like one one twelfth of the size of the brain to have the important stuff. So Maybe there, there, there's some credibility, but like again, we should question. Premise two is commonsensical. True, premise four is obviously true as well. Our bodies and brain are constantly gaining new cells and losing new ones, or at least gaining new atoms and more like you're losing old ones. So understood, bodies and brains are a constant flux. I assume eight present the only life option for most ordinary people. This leaves premise one and six. Let's start with one. Why should we believe ordinary material objects composed of parts that do not remain the same? If they through part replacement? Why is meteorological essentialism problematic by virtue of all versions of physicalism, or at least most versions of it, besides those that identify us with atomic simple? Because the virtue of physicalism identify us or claim as constituted by meteorological aggregates, and though it's unpopular to say so, meteorological if they cannot be avoided for such holes. Given part alteration, physicalism does not have an ontological resource capable of providing such chronic the types of unity need for meteorological aggregation to be continued. It may even be that physical research does not have the ontological resource to have avoided eliminism, which I, even though as a physical research myself, I am against the eliminism like most experts. Here's the definition of meteorological aggregation. It's a particular whole composed of at least separate parts of external relationships between and among those separate parts. Why do you think meteorological essentialism should characterize meteorological aggregates? Because a proper metaphysical analysis of such whole provides no ethnic identity adequate to ground metaphysical, their literal identity through part alteration. To illustrate, suppose we have some meteorological aggregate. We say car in the actual world if we stone it and let the piece refer distribute to all only to atomic symbols, assuming such to make up, and get this specific list of symbols taken distribute regardless of structure. A different list of symbols, Q will not be identical to the piece, even if both lists share all but one part of common. The same insight will be true if we 
would take the piece and cube collectively requires some sort of meteorological sum. In either the case, no identity over and above purchases is ground sameness through alteration. As the uh, we are different persistent condition from and thus is not identical to the P. W could be destroyed and the P taken in their sense could exist. Let S stand for O only to various the relations standing between among the P's. If the, and S is W types of structure. Is W identical to S and the P's? No. We have its own structure. We say compares it to some other host W. Exactly same to the structure W. W and W at this grass with their own structure. Given that S is universal, it's not sufficient for into a GW specific structure. And that we need SI, W structure instance. W is talking of S and SI with the will constitute of all and only relate uh, relate instances that are essential between among the P's. Let there stand for all and only relevant relation instead of composed SI. I think it's now obvious that SI is mere logical aggregate composed of the R's. If the R's undergo change of relation instead, there is no longer the same list of relation instances. Given that SI is just the mere logical aggregate or perhaps a different structure perhaps the similar to SI. Obtain since no identity serves as ground for SI sameness through part replacement. If W is the P plus SI follow the W subject to meteorological essential constraints. What about promise, uh, premise 6? I do survive over time the same object. Why, why should we think to survive the same object over time? Suppose you are approaching to brown table and you undergo a series of table experience during the process. In this series of experience, you are aware of different aspects of the table and different moments. However, each moment you are also aware of the self who is having those experiences, uniting them into a field of consciousness across time. Moreover, you are also aware that every same self has all experiencing during the process. Fine, you are aware that the self has all experience is you yourself. Though introspection, you are aware that your self owns the un unified the experience at each moment. If the, and you are the same dur during throughout time. This is pretty obvious to most people. Basic telema experience. A basic, on the base of this time, the belief that we are in their subject or cells is properly basic. An experience may be helped convince you this. Right now, I'm looking for a chair in my office, and I walk towards the chair. I experience a series of cofemological objects and chair representation. This is, has several different uh, chair experience to replace one another in rapid succession. As I approach the chair, with my chair sensation vary and my pay attention, I'm also aware of two more things. First, I do not simply experience the sensation of a chair. Rather, through self-awareness, I'm also experiencing the fact that as myself who has chair experience, each chair sensation proves that each angle perspective that has a perceived who is, and I, a computer sense experiment, produce series of awareness. I am experiencing a chair sense image now. I am also aware of the basic fact that the same cell that is currently having a fairly large chair experience is my eyes come to win, uh, within 12 inches of the chair. If the same cell is one who had all other chair experience proceed the current one. Through self-awareness, I am the fact that I am enduring. I who had I who was and is and will be presented as the owner of the experience of the series. These two facts I am the owner of experience I am enduring cells show that I am not identical to my experience. I am conscious thing that has them. I am also aware of myself as a simple, uncomposed, especially unextended center of consciousness. In short, I am a mental substance. Moreover, I am 40% throughout my body. If my arm is cut off, I do not become four-fifths of a self. My body and brain are divisible. It can be presented in percentage. There could be 80% of the brain presented after operation. But, in all, but I am an all or not the kind of thing. I am not divisible. I cannot be presented in percentage. Another consideration that provides reasonable belief that we are enduring continuous involve a case of thinking through the modest ponus syllogism. Consider the process recently through the instance of modus ponens, which at times t1 to t5. One attempts for the first premise, if p then q, the second premise p, the two premise together, if p then q, and p, draws a conclusion of q, and then attempt conclusively, precisely as the conclusion. At times t3, one must attend to the two premises simultaneously, becoming acquainted via rational intuitive and more hostile called eidetic intuition with the logical relation between the two propositions in order to draw the conclusion and attempt precisely as such. At T3, the cell that attend to one premise and the cell that attend the other premises stand in absolute identity to each other such as self is irreducible, unified, substantial I. Not only must 
there be a unified self in each time in sequence, but there also must be an identical self in a dual through the rational act. Now consider A.C. Wayne's argument. To really like the truth of any proposition, even if entertain something meaningful, uh, the same being must be aware of its different constitutes. To be aware of the validity of an argument, the same being must entertain premises and conclusions. To compare two things, the same being must, at least in memory, be aware of them simultaneously. And since all these processes take some time in continuous existence of literally the same identity is required, in these cases, an event that constitutes a contemplating a followed by another event with constitute complaint by B is sufficient. They must be event on a contemporary occur during the same being. If one being throw a wolves, another of eating, another of lands, it certainly would not mean by anybody contemplate proposition wolves eat lamb. There must surely be some a simple being present uh, persistent through the process to grasp a proposition or inference as a whole. If the conclusion of syllogism is to be grasped as a conclusion, it must be drawn from the experience of each premise, singularly and then together. As Edward notes in 1973, a successive series of eye stages cannot engage in such edge, only an enduring eye can. Moreover, in the rational agent who embrace the conclusion is to be regarded as an intellectually responsible for this reasoning, it must be the same self at the end of the process as the self who live through the stage of reasoning led to a drawing the conclusion one who is not responsible for that of others or other person's stage so intellectual responsibility seems to presuppose an enduring i and we have seven two arguments of substance to list the model mirrorological it's time to turn the major objections to it by both physicalists and idealists alike and the problem of causal interaction which is by far the one that convinced me that is not true Right there. In this section, I state the provide three responses. At the the disambigu uh, ah, I can speak today. At the the disambiguity, how can mental entity casually interact with the physical? Sometimes an opponent of uh, something to listen will simply press the question: How can mental entity interact with physical entity? Dialectically, this move is supposed to place the dualist in a bad place. From he slash she slash they will have a hard time escaping. Unfortunately, the question is ambiguous. It has two different meanings. Thus, to address the question, I shall break it down into two questions and address each one in turn. First, the question may be required for a mechanism between mental and physical entities in virtue which they interact with each other. For example, if one asks how turning on a car's ignition swiftly caused the engine to start, one is requesting a description of mechanism a system that actually between the ignition and the engine in virtue, which return to the former starts the latter. If this is correct, interpretation of, of our original question, then something dualism is a complete non starter. Why? Because according to Sartre dualism, it uh, will hold the casual connection between mental and physical entity is f basic, such there are nothing between them by virtue, unless you are pluralist, which this is not a problem for the because there's more to two substances, like Karl Popper, who was a pluralist, there were at least three substances. If physical response by saying the discovery of such mechanisms precisely what neuroscience give us, dual listen will respond by pointing out that all neuroscience provides in increasingly precise correlation that leaves mental physical interaction basic, even if physical side correlation turns out to be complicated system neurons. Second, the question that may be understood simply as an expression of skeptical expiration, uh, expiration perhaps based on differences between mental and physical entity. Given these differences, how could such interaction take place? It strains credibility to believe such a thing as Keith Yendo note. The skeptics seem to know that casual interaction violates some necessary truths such as one, like can only affect in not like can only affect the like, or two, what is in space can only be affected what is in space. Uh, regardless, uh, regarding one, yet do not that this assuming the casual likeness principle. If A costs Q in B, then A must itself have Q. The problem with the principle is that there are numerous actual and possible counterexamples to it. The retinal excitation produces a color sensation. Imbalance of ear fluids causes vertigo. The Big Bang produces massive mass emigration, space, and time. In the history of science, particles were thought to interact with with the ether, caloric, phylogiston, fields, and so on. If these theories turn out to be false, they could have been true, that is, they were metaphysically possible. Finally, we have far more grounds for believing that interaction takes place than we do for the casual likeness principle. So if anything has to go in the la is the latter, not the former. 
regarding to proposition of the former A, which is now spatial, casually affects spa uh, spatial B, and spatial B casually affects A, which is now spatial, do not entail Q and not Q state of affairs. A may have Q as a casual disposition and brings about in B, or conversely, the proposition could be true in spite of the spatiality of one, the casual relative and non spatiality of the other. Moreover, it is perfectly intelligible that that whatever is a god or no god is omnipresent in reductive sense, strictly speaking. At the, what is the problem? Most finally, substitute does not hold that the soul is not spatially located, though most hold that it is not spatially extended. So even if this object is out, it is irrelevant to substitutism. We also have the casual interaction violates the converse, uh, conservation of energy principle. A basic principle in physics is that the trajectory of any physical entity is changed. This amount of acceleration, which requires the expenditure of energy. Now, if one decides to raise one's arm to vote, and the sequence of physical events in the ages bring go to the different direction the arm goes up, there would be the arm stays down, then the agent had not acted on his slash her slash they direct decision. Thus the energy was expanded in interjection into physical stems, the agent's brain and the body, but this viol this but this violates the conservation of energy principle that energy can neither be created nor destroy. Why? Because a mental act intervenes into brain body and must create new energy since the interventionist gives the system energy it did not have. This is the base of the two assumption. One, the principle of conservation applied to all purely physical interaction and to all casual interaction between a mass must evolve in exchange of energy. But as Robin Collins argued, the first assumption is false for the case of gen general relativity. The second assumption is false for the case of quantum mechanics, that based on current physics, the energy conservation object has little if any merit. According to Collins, the principle of the conservation energy is false in general relativity theory. A reference frame is basically a frame of reference related to the location of an observer. It is used to observation description of physical phenomena. Many physical phenomena, such as duration of time, spatial extension, and relative relative to the reference frame, but some physical entities are frame independent quantities taken to intrinsic characteristic of an object. In general relativity, a quantum known as strength energy tension such as frame independent quantity of, of an object, but the object's energy cannot be considered. Thus the relations of strategy of the object the conservation energy prioritize the tissue cannot be defined for gravitational fields or objects within them, so it is no law of conservation for interaction uh, for interaction involving gravity. So, although gravitational field catching influence objects in various ways, their influence cannot be understood with respect to the movement of energy through space. Within general relativity, energy is not conserved because the law of conservation is not well defined. So, in the presence of gravitational field, the total non gravitational energy within enclosed regions space and could increase such decrease without corresponding net physically tenable energy flowing across the region's boundary. So, there is a gain in energy without the energy existing somewhat beforehand. Collins suggest that, like gravitational field, the mind may be a place where the conservation energy simply does not apply. Thus, the mind could cause a real change in brain's energy without energy being conserved. Regarding number two, it is widely acknowledged that a phenomenon known as quantum entanglement, casual interaction takes place without any exchange of energy. To grasp quantum entanglement, let us suppose to have subatomic particle that has a physical attribute of quantum, i.e., spin, spin that can exist in only two ways to say up or down, and can only be described with respect to each other, even if they are especially distant from each other. So for example, say are two particles of such that if one has an upward spin, the other must have a downward spin, and convertly. Now if our system concludes the two particle, if one is measured to have a upward spin, and the other will simultaneously be caused to have a downward spin, even though they could not be in exchange of energy, due to the distance between the particle and simultaneously of the casual effects. Causation occurs without exchange of energy, and there is no reason against the idea that mind slash brain casual interaction do not involve a change of energy and thus do not violate the conservation of energy principle. Besides these two points, more that can be said about the so called conservation of energy principle. 1. The principle is not a metaphysical one. It is necessary if something is colored than it is standing, in which case it would be metaphysically necessary to throughout all possible worlds. Rather, it is a mere empirical generalization, like all ravers of black, which could admit as exception. Moreover, the principle used to be stated properly. In ordinary physical process, energy is neither created nor destroyed. 
This intentionally left open the fact that mental causation was not an ordinary physical process and thus did not violate the conservation principle. Let us suppose their exercise of exciting power involving a free action does, in fact, involve the mental creation of energy. So what? The conservation principle does not even apply to mental causation, but you may ask, then why we not detect the increasing energy in, say, the brain that results from free action? I'm not sure anyone has tried to look for such energy, but it's plausible that it may be slight and significant that it cannot be detected. I think the massive amount of energy in the water held by the Hoover Dam now suppose someone flips a switch with his finger, and this opens out the dam, releasing all the potential energy. The energy is took to flip the switch is real, but, so com but small compared to the actual relief by the dam opening and would be undetectable. This may well be what's going on with mental condensation. The trigger the release a comparatively large amount of potential energy stored in the brain and body. The casual interaction fails prey to the problem of casual pairing. The dualist problem of casual pairing was first raised by John Foster, but in recent years it was revised straight by Jago King in his book Physicalism was Something Near Enough. The argument is direct towards a version of Cartesian dualism that treats the soul as a non spatial located entity casually connected to its body. The suppose that we are true physical options, A and B, a rifles. They are physically indistinguishable in all aspects except for their spatial location. Four of the two targets simply indistinguishable. When A and B fire shots simultaneously, why do A and B hit targets C and D respectively? The answer seems obvious. For focusing on A is to point at C and not D, and there is a spatial continuous catch-up path from A to C. In general, says Kim, is the spatial location or an orientation of cause and effect, along with properly directed casual pathways between them that explain why the cause brought above the effect. But now a problem raised for the version of dualism is the under consideration. Suppose two people are mentally indistinguishable or conscious state, willing to raise one's left arm. If the and two body slash brain are physically indistinguishable, why does body Person's a mental state cause an effect in one body, like raising your left arm, rather than the other one. The answer cannot be that a mental state causes his arm to move and not the other person, because the answer is circular. Why? A causes his arm to move, but makes the specific arm A is that A so is casually connected to it, but simply a cause to arm move in which A is cause connected. This is circular, nor can answer. B, A is a mental state especially oriented towards one arm and not the other as the rightful cause because A and the mental state are not especially located. It seems that the mental slash physical casual interaction is incoherent. What can a, uh, what can a substitute say about this problem? First, assuming the soul, uh, soul is not located in space, it may be there is a metaphysical and an analog to a special location that solves the problem. Suppose numbers are real, abstract object 1 and 2, etc. There is a real sign which each number is located in a specific place in the number sequence. Similarly, there may be a metaphysical gride which a uh, mind are located. If this is true, then a mind A causes movement in a particular body because A is properly metaphysical located with respect to the particular body. This is what makes that body A. A accordingly, and the A then casually interact with only with his body. Secondly, virtually all contemporary software dualists believe that mind is specially located, uh, is located even though it is not extended. Some provide argument for a mind be located in one specific place in in the body, and others play, uh, believe that mind is to be is the body as a deity to space, namely 40% in each location of the body. This view is called uh, holomerism. Either way, the spatial location requirement is satisfied. Third, some do this provide deeper grounding or causation one, make, one makes a given body belong to a specific mind. For example, a domestic dualist claims that the mind or its essence inform a body, but what makes the body belong to a particular mind? The Thomas can say that a mind casually interacts with and only with its own mind. If the more could set the response to the problem of casual parry, but it not have been offered to show that the problem is hardly a defeat for if the mental slash physical casual interactions. In conclusion, in 1993, physical philosopher David Papineriu firmly asserted that nearly everybody nowadays wants to be an actualist. Uh, 
well, I am a naturalist, so <laughs> I'm in the table. A beginner could go on to defend strict physicalist version of naturalism. I think this is largely true today, through less to say because the growing revival of non naturalist or in this case non physicalist theories like idealism and dualism. There's still much work to do so at the, of this revival. And let's at the hope at the and substitutes are far more common with the idealism with physicalism. A point to defend substitutes what projects its own right in regard to propose in the peer review paper. Two to space consideration has sought to provide limited defense of substitute, leave it to the reader to assert whether or not limited defense is persuasive. So this revival of non physicalist theories and now with Winger's friend a possibility revival of do substance dualism of all things, weirdly enough, maybe reconsider. And I will quote by the co founder of a, the, of a skeptic uh, organization, like you know, that will later become Skeptical Inquiry Center for Inquiry and Richard Darkin Association of Sciences, th stuff like that, right? At the, one of the co founders of the modern secular humanist skeptical movement that we have, like Mar Marcelo Trussi. The, who makes a solid case in on scepticism a reflection of the reception of unconventional claims in science on November 29 1989 colloquium presented by Mercer State, a, a PhD professor of sociology at the reported at the his studies as a sociologist of science, I remain outside the conventional surrounding unconventional claims in science. My commitment is to the judicial process within the scientific community, rather than a resolution of specific debates. My general concern is trying to foster an interdisciplinary program, best called anomalistic, on the study of fact that seem unexplained by current models. In order to study anomalities in science, we have to be interdisciplinary at the, because we, do, we don't know ultimately where an anomaly will fit in. For example, if it's a UFO, we don't know how it will contribute to astronomy, sociology, psychology, or meteorology in the end. An interdisciplinary approach to anomaly is absolutely necessary. There are three broad approaches to anomaly study. The first approach is usually called the 14 approach. It's generally characterized by critics who call mystery mongering. The main problem with it is that you give an explanation to a phenomenon if you agree with the system of the anomaly. The present the representatives of this approach are unhappy because they prefer the idea of mystery. The second common approach is what critics usually call the bunkers approach. This is the main attitude of the orthodox scientific community towards anomalous claims. It is characterized by my, uh, as a co-founder of the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, whether its claim is nothing but something else. Seemingly anomalous phenomena are denied first, something investigated only second. Like the 14, the debunker is not concerned with the full explanation. Whereas the 14 type don't want explanation, the debunkers don't need them and they believe they already they already have them. At the, the third approach, which I tried to empower legitimate, is sedetic. It's an old word coming from a Greek followers, skeptical philosopher of ferrorialism, which the scientific method is under that principle, under fossil viability. The main feature of this approach is to emphasize the communal norm and skepticism presented to the scientific community. By skepticism, I would like to strongly distinguish between doubt and denial. Doubt is a skeptical approach. The debunker's approach is denial. The true skepticism, which is part of science, consists of doubt proceeding inquiry and then essentially takes the position of a non-believer rather than a disbeliever. The main elements of approach are first, ignorance, secondly, some doubt, thirdly, emphasis upon in inquiry. John Sanders peers require that the first and primary obligation of every philosopher and scientist and mathematician to do nothing that will block inquiry. This approach involves general acceptance of what Mario Boone called Methodism on, on science as method, not science as established absolute body of knowledge. The most important thing here is that maverick ideas of unconventional claims and normality must be viewed not as crisis but as opportunity. Some of these claims, probably a small minority, will in fact turn out to have some substance because after all, that is what drives science forward, where are abnormality and their validation. Later incorporating explanation, we will not have any progress in science. We have a fundamental problem in science of somehow trying to balance openness with conservatism and imagination and creativity with criticism. How can we keep science an open system? From the history of science, create a radical conception and innovation are not accepted until all orthodox interpretation have failed. There are different viewpoints like Michael Polanyi's defense of the conservative side. 
I don't agree with Polanyi, the good scientist is one who is unprejudiced with, with an open mind, ready to embrace new ideas supported by fact. The history of science shows, however, that this is not usually the case. The burden of proof is not only of the claimant, but is faced with denial rather than simple doubt. As one look at the history of science, a number of other industry concepts have been put forward. Gunther Stern argued there have been premature ideas ahead of their time, with the culture that has not ready to accept. The same is true for post-mature science. There are cases where knowledge was available for some time, but never developed, but new development was slow to come. The example is the laser. The history of science full of some very notable rejections. Some of them are now even silly sounding. Like Lord Kevin said the X-ray will prove to be a hoax. Thomas Watson once think there is a world market for about five computers. This got so bad in 1889, Charles Dool, who sent to the commission of the U.S. office Office of Patents wrote a letter to President McKinley asking him to abolish the patent office since everything can be invented has been invented. If the Ernst Marx said he could not accept the fear of relativity anymore that he was at the set of atoms and other such dogmas, as he put it. Edison proposed that it has so no commercial feature for light bulb. When a phonograph was first demonstrated at the French Academy of Science, one scientist leaped up, grabbed the exhibitor, and started shaking him and said, I will be taken in by your ventriloquist. Roland Moore called atomic power moonshine. The history of science is full of such crazy stories. The best interpretation of this can be given by what is called type 1 and type 2 error. Type 1 is thinking that something special is happening when nothing special is really happening. Type 2 error is thinking that nothing special is happening when in fact something rare or infrequent is happening. Obviously there are at opposite poles and you, you increase your probability of avoiding one kind of error by increasing the probability of making the other kind. When a conventional claim is made, we must decide whether it is discovered or some kind of mistake. There are fundamental three kinds of error. It could be mistaken or accident, an artifact or a bit variety. These three have different degrees of moral stigma attached to them. Everybody makes mistakes, but fraud is something else. Most interesting for the sociology of science is the relationship between scientists making the claim and the scientific community and how the claim gets labeled by them. In general, we can distinguish between Isaac Asimov called endoretics and esoretics. Endoretics are properly credentialed scientists. If a person outside the scientific community, at least outside of his specialty, he is an esoretic. If a person is an endoretic, he could be considered eccentric and incompetent, where if the person is esoteric, he will be regarded as a crackpot, charlatan, or fraud. In general, most people, especially with the anomalies, continue tend to accept the idea that there are three basic ways in which the general scientific community will probably come around to accept their claim. The first is they can produce a, rep a replica phenomena, especially one replicated by skeptics. The second is to hold that acceptable theory would develop some mechanisms that will predict the phenomenon. The third is a successful application which will bypass the scientific community altogether. We must remember that anomaly is essentially an extraordinary claim which extraordinary is always something that is matter of degree. An anomaly can only be spoken of sensible in relation to a certain theory that it seems to violate. But the theory change. If the theoretical framework changes and is made more hospitable to the previous outlandish claim, that claim may no longer be an anomalous. Also, science is hardly unified. The theory one science may not be exactly comparable with the theory in the another science. So they may be accepted as anomaly in one science, may be much less of an anomaly in another. For example, Lord Kelvin said that the age of a sun was too young to allow the earth to be old enough to support Darwin's theory of evolution. If the biology had listened to the leading physicists of the day, they would have given up evolutionary theories as what well, violates physics violates biology. Luckily, physicists came around to change his point of view when fusion was discovered and the sun was seen to be much older, making evolutionary theory possible. Only time will tell what is premature and what is postmature in science. In recent years in history, philosophy, and psychology of science, there are now strong voices such as those of constructivism and relativism. Speaking out against the older classical positivist view of Max Planck, one said that a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing his opponents, but rather because opponents eventually die and a new generation grow up with that's familiar with it. In the sociology of science, one viewpoint represented by David Blue, it was considered as a bedrock of conceptual science, is social negative. Negotiated. Some of the basis central to the scientific method like replication are extremely problematic. What is considered to be true replication is something very much negotiable. When parapsychologists claim to replicate an experiment, critics do their best to point out, even nitpick, how different the experiments are. 
Thus, it is difficult sometimes to tell exactly what its true replication is. Is, some, is someone like James Rand, a machine accomplished in a stage show, who appears to be what a psychic does in a laboratory under controlled condition? Then most critics say that Randy has replicated what psychics has achieved. This is an unfair comparison. The mistake the medical sentence occurred paradise is an all significant problem. Flu was the first to not the mistake believe the science considered nothing but proven proposition, and felt this was a demand made only by those who crave authority and need to replace religious catechism with scientific ones. We must distinguish between anti-scientific and non-scientific ideas. There are those who are willing to play the scientific rule game but who are not accepted for some reason or another. I call them proto-scientists. Some proto-scientists are widely accepted. Parapsychology is one of the most sophisticated and accepted since the Parapsychological Association is affiliated with the AAAS, the most authoritative organization when it comes to scientific programs. Then there are also quasi-scientific belief system. Astrology is the best example of this. People claim that it is compatible with science, freely proper scientific rules, but there is no experimental verification. Astrologers are not anti-scientific, but simply practitioners. They are pragmatic and uh, esoteric thinkers. They claim to have discovered the secret of the universe. They are anti-scientific. If they cannot explain it, they hold the latter on scientists will explain it. If not, to them, it doesn't matter much. Though it sounds outlandish, Throughout the history of science, many breakthroughs occurred that way. Anesthesia is a good example. There are no proper mechanisms even today to explain fundamentally but it works. That we have the mystical approach purely subjective of two types. One, consensual mystical occultism, which is intersubjective, and two, solidarity mysticism. Obviously, there are a large spectrum of approaches we can differ in externally claims first in terms of mainstream acceptance or rejection, whether they are methodological accepted or not. There are also things which are institutional unacceptable despite good methodology. Pro scientific efforts, in my opinion, such as parapsychology, is the Oh, it is best always meet certain hostility and anomalies and accusations of pseudoscience. Finally, there are things that which are unacceptable, both methodological and intuitionally. This is pseudoscience. One must consider the distinction between anomalies or extraordinary events that have been examined scientifically versus non-scientific, such as via metaphysics or theology. We can distinguish between the abnormal, the paranormal, and the supernatural. If something is real or extraordinary science, but it is expandable, we call it abnormal. The term paranormal refers to something that the science can play someday, but at the present moment it cannot. These are the scientific frontiers. However, there are things that are fundamentally inexplicable by science, the supernatural. Critics often confuse the paranormal and supernatural and turn it into a political fight. One could distinguish also also between variables of facts and relationship of process. If we are ordinary facts in ordinary relationship, we may call it normal orthodox science. We have ordinary facts in extraordinary relationships such as two people who have the same thought being linked to the ESP. This is parascience. We usually see the fact with inferred processes. All kinds of ordinary facts can be considered from proper extraordinary relationships. If we are extraordinary fat in other relationship, for example, a dinosaur in Loch Ness, that would be crypto scientific claim. What is required to bring anomalous claim into scientific acceptance? If crypto science, no replication is needed, one big food capture will suffice. For parascience, replication is required. If the anomalous claim has to a topple over every other normal explanation of the result, whereas in crypto science it is easy to prove but difficult to falsify hypothesis. In parascience, it is easy to falsify and hard to validate. People often co confuse parascience with crypto science. For example, a white crow is a cryptozoological phenomenon. All too often in parapsychology, people talk it through crypto scientific claims were being made, as where a single critical ex experiment will prove it. That is ridiculous from a scientific point viewpoint. The History and philosophy of science show that there is no such thing as a critical experiment. A single experiment doesn't change the body of science. A replication change in the theory must follow and perhaps the whole world must follow. There are some myths about science and scientists that need to be dispelled. Science gets mistake as a body of knowledge for its method. Scientists are regarded as having superhuman ability of rationality at their objectivity. Many science psychology has show otherwise. Originally, I was invited to be a court chairman of the CSICO poll by Paul Courts. 
I helped to write the bylaws and edit their, their journals. I found myself attacked by a community members and board who considered me true self of the paranormalist. My position was not a threat to per- proto-scientists as ever series, but look to the best of them and ask them for their best scientific evidence. I found that the community was very much interested in attacking the most publicly visible claimants such as National Inquiry. The major interest of the community was not inquiry but to serve as an advocate body, a popular religious group for scientific orthodoxy. The community has made many mistakes. Many objected to the community. The reason I chose to leave it was that it was taking the public position that presented the scientific community serving as gatekeepers of meritic claims, whereas I felt they were simply unqualified to add this judge and jury when they were simply lawyers. Despite serious philosophical and sociological questions about how well the system works, I believe in the process of science and scientific progress. Science is a self-correcting system, encouragement of fair play and due process in the scientific arena, will allow the self-correction to work best, and advertising of opinions and dialogue and extreme import that we cannot close the door of moralic claims. Another paper that we have the by the conference study of quantum mechanics and application of the ER equals EPR and Winger's friend, which makes the case for something dualism, or uh, he's called it quantum physicalism, by Patrick Yanti and Navarra University, uh, University of Algeria. The study dates a quantum physics application at E Quantum University of Algeria in 2018. Like I said, there is a strong core revival of something that for the longest time we rejected, usually from a discourse uh, we associate with religion. The condition dualism physically, uh, physically seen as an intrusive property and viewpoint as a shortcoming. Claim quantum dualism is fundamentally different from condition dualism or quantum physicalism. The only problem with the previous question is they subscribe to some form of uh, the locality, although remove that part doesn't change the theory as much. And also another interesting by Henry Stubb who made a paper in the theoretical physicist group and National Laboratory in the University of California. He wrote a paper about the orthodox quantum mechanics is technically built around elements of the von Neumann core process. The resolution produces a rational career realization for the theory that preserves the basic orthodox structure that allows naturally for the possibility that human personality may survive bodily death. So, like again, this is an interesting development in the past recent years of science, and let's see where the evidence goes.